Awesome. I think we'll get started. Please find a seat, and if you haven't already done so, there were snacks outside. My name is Carol McKibben, and I'm a lecturer in history at Stanford University and the director of, a, of an exciting new public history project sponsored by the city of Salinas that aims to rethink, rewrite, and represent the history of this city in regional, state, and national context in both the academic world and in popular culture. Place matters. And I'm here to welcome you to a conversation about a special and important place in Salinas history, Alisal, which is also known as the Alisal. This con conversation is not merely to celebrate Alisal, but also to think critically about it. Alisal has occupied a liminal space in Salinas history since the inception of the city. We're here today to explore what that might mean, past and present. We have a panel of distinguished residents and former residents, including our incredible former mayor and current assembly member, Ana Caballero, here to help us. I will introduce each panelist in a moment, but first I would like to thank the city of Salinas, uh, Salinas City Manager Ray Corpus, whose vision for the city encompasses both economic and cultural revitalization. I've known Ray for a decade. I thought he was going to be here, but obviously not. And I'll tell you that the fir at first and foremost, he's a champion of inclusion and collaboration. We have two members of the C Salinas City Council here, I think. Steve McShane? No. Okay, maybe not. And Tony Villegas? I guess not. All right, so uh, none of this event would have been possible without the incredible support from Taylor Farms uh, and in the person of Margaret Diarigo, who's done everything from providing refreshments to making sure we have video recording capability and microphones. She is magic. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a table here. She's um, the epitome of collaboration and efficiency. She personifies the spirit of accomplishment that is integral to what defines Alisal as well as Salinas. The Salinas Chamber of Commerce, in the person of Tom Taft, thank you Tom, where are you? Uh, has been a vital partner providing everything from research support to connective threads in this community to publicity. Thank you Tom. Thank you to Hartnell College for the videography and uh, collaborative support, to Alice Al High School for the use of space, and to everyone else who helped. Sandra Ocampo, Don Shababa, Karen Cameron from the public schools, all of whom have helped in getting the word out for today. Now our panel. We'll begin um, in a moment. I'm going to introduce everybody first, and then you can start, Patricia, with Patricia Jane Adcock Garlinger, who began her life in Alice Al decades ago, in the years preceding the Dust Bowl migration, so the 1920s. Her family, both hers and her husband's, have roots in the 19th century, um, from the very first migrations of Danish and Swedish immigrants. And she has been involved in ranching in Alisal ever since. <clears throat> Got it? Right? Okay. Uh, as part of the ra a ranching family, she watched critical demographic and environmental changes in Salinas over the course of the 20th century, which she will share with us today. Her family owned and operated the very first water company in Salinas, uh, in Alisal, and generously helped newcomers to this place uh, make their, um, establish themselves over the course of the entire 20th century. Uh, Assemblyperson Ana Caballero has been a public servant for over 30 years. She was elected as Salinas' first female mayor in 1998 and is responsible for, among so many innovations and great positive policies, raising funds to save our libraries and providing critical city services during a time when we were in a statewide budget crisis. She was elected to the State Assembly in 2006 and in that role has been a most committed and successful advocate for residents here 
um, ameliorating policy in everything from recreational facilities to health care to water uses and access to building affordable housing and reducing crime due to gang violence. Bill Ramsey was born and raised in the Alice South. He's a child of the Dust Bowl who married his Salinas High School sweetheart, Marlene Sobrana, in 1951. They're married still. He joined Man Packing in 1955 and became a partner in the company along with Don Nucci and Horace Mann in 1976. And he played football? His family still leads this firm. Bill has served on the Salinas School Board as president and in multiple capacities in Salinas as a public servant and community leader. His heart is here. He's a gracious, kind, generous person, as Patricia and Anna are as well, <laughs> with a deep commitment to this community and great insight into the growth and development of Salinas over the course of the 20th century. Jim Gaddis is also a child of the Dust Bowl an accomplished businessman, the founding director of the Salinas International Air Show, which just happened. His numerous awards reflect his commitment to this city and to its people. He won a Spirit of the Community Award, Citizen of the Year, Humanitarian of the Year, board member for the Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. And like Bill, one of the kindest, most gracious, generous souls with a deep commitment to Salinas and great insight into the changing face of this city. We can see from these life stories a common thread of upward mobility based on an incredible work ethic, optimistic outlook, perseverance, and a heartfelt commitment to this community that is reflected in both action and words. All of our panelists are both observers of critical change and activists and change agents themselves. So we would like to begin our panel with a brief um, contribution from each of our panelists about how, what Salinas meant to them, what their experience has been in this city, and what they hope to dispel in terms of myths about Alicell that are, have been so prevalent, not just in um, the media, but in academic accounts as well. So let's begin with Patricia, who, by the way, is turning 39 tomorrow? 59. Uh, reverse that, and you got it. <laughs> Sounds a lot better. <laughs> First, I would like to thank you very much, Carol, for asking me to be on the panel. I appreciate it. I am serving for my... Could I just ask, we have an interpreter here, and I was wondering if there's anyone that needs interpretation service. Hay alguien que necesita un intérprete para entender la presentación? Nadie? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I just wanted to check. Thank you, Luz, for being here. <laughs> I want to thank you, Carol, very much for asking me. I'm sitting in place of my younger sister, Joanne, who is in uh, the hospital uh, today and um, doing well, I hope. I haven't had a chance to talk to her. But first I want to ask, is there anybody that lived in the al before 1924? <laughs> or 25? I was born October 8, 1922, in Salinas on Maple Street. My dad was a U.S. postal employee, my mother a stay-at-home mother, and he wanted to move to a ranch or a country. Well, you know who won? My dad won. So out we toodled, my dad, my mother, my sister and I, out to Route 2, Box 105, Del Monte Avenue, and there we started our life in the L cell. I, um, fortunately, it was right next door to the El Cell School. So I just climbed through the fence and went to school every day. I went to school there for six years until all of a sudden a, a schoolhouse appeared on the grounds one day and we all said, well, what's happening? And we found out they'd unified with the El Cell School District. So we had to change our name to the Alisal School. Well, that was terrible. We just thought that was terrible they'd do that to us. 
And so then I proceeded to graduate in 1936 from the Alice L. School. Attended Salinas Union High School till 1940. I became hostess of the California Rodeo in 1940, the greatest, one of the greatest moments of my life. I went on to attend Salinas Junior College, which is now Hartnell. Graduated with an AA degree, then went on to get my very special degree of Mrs. M.R.S. Garlinger. <laughs> so that was the history of what I did. As If you all would close your eyes and think about the LSL with no houses, just beautiful old fields with pigs and cattle and uh, dry grain being grown and just about three or four houses from Del Monte Avenue into town to the, over the railroad tracks. And now you open your eyes today and my heavens, I drove out and I thought, it's happened. It's a community. It's a, a metropolis full of everything. And uh, that's what I was raised in, was a quiet, peaceful little country town. We got finally got a grocery store in the corner of Del Monte and uh, um, uh, Del Monte and Williams Road, <laughs> signs all the time. And uh, it was run by a Chinaman, and it was Billy, and we loved Billy. And we'd ride our bicycles down the end of Del Monte Avenue to the to. Uh, uh, go down way down to off of Sanford Road and we go to a grocery store there to buy my mother a loaf of bread. This is before Billy's grocery store. And uh, there was a big pig farm down there and a dairy. And then where the old barn was, which is now Chavez Library, was uh, a dairy and I used to walk down there to get milk for the family in a little bucket. I can still remember walking down the Williams Road so um, I was trying to think if there was anything else that I could tell you about. My dad started the water company in 1932. He was, had sold some property off to some people and they were getting water. He provided water for them and somebody got an idea that something went wrong and they reported it to the PUC. And they said, well, Mr. Adcock, you've got to either start a water company or quit selling water to them. So. They had a big argument, my mother and dad. My dad won, so he started the water company. And there were the four of us by that time. I was the oldest, my sister Jerry, my brother Tom, who was deceased, and my sister Joanne. And um, I married, and I left the Alcell in 1942, married a farmer, which I was never going to do, but I did. <laughs> Raised five daughters. And I'm living to be almost 95 tomorrow. Okay, that's my story. Thanks, Pat. Uh, my story is a little different. Interesting. I'm 85, Pat's 95, so we had a decade in between us. And you'll find that Jim's about five years younger than I am, so there's a different recollection of the Al Sap. So going back to the Ramsey family, how did we end up out here? Well, my dad was a farm, cotton farmer and cattle rancher in Texas. And in 1929, during the, one of the peaks of the Depression, we lost our uh, ranch. So my mother, I want you to picture something. My mother and dad and nine kids came out here in one car. And I look back and think that's impossible. How could you get 11 people into a car and then travel across half the United States? But they did. They arrived here in 1930, and I was born in 1932. So I guess I was just a gleam in my father's eye when he left Texas. But I was the tenth of those nine children, and then I had a younger sister, Margaret. So the total in the Ramsey family was 11 of us. A couple of things that are kind of uh, not understood well. We have the Depression in the United States, and that's where my dad lost his business. We also had the Dust Bowl. There were two separate entities that kind of happened at the same time. But the Dust Bowl was more in the 30s, and the Depression ended, uh, started somewhere in the 20s. So we got out of here, 
And I actually lived in Salinas from the time I was born, in 1932, till 1940. And it was then that the Ramsey family moved to the Al Sal. And it had to do with economics. We probably didn't have any money. So we moved out to uh, a street called Bonita Street. And I went to the Sherwood School. And I did this in the third grade. And then we moved to Al Sal Street. And I was in the third grade. And then we moved to a place called Pacific Avenue that Pat and I were just talking about. And I'm still in the third grade. And, and both all of this is at Sherwood School and Al South Elementary School. So time came and went. And then uh, I went to Al South School when I was in the sixth grade and the seventh grade. And that's when I became acquainted with you and I was chatting about Mrs. Barton, Mrs. Rocco. You know, I, I must tell you that uh, the decade that the Ramsey family lived in Al Sal was just about perfect. No one had anything to speak of, so our chances of having something stolen from us was slim and none. That wasn't going to happen. And it was also a time, and I remember it well because I was nine years old, and the Second World War began, and I remember exactly right up on a Sunday morning. And I remember my two brothers going into the military at that time, and I remember the war coming and going and ending. And then I remember Al South flourishing. And for those of you who don't know it, there was a time when Salinas wanted Al South to join Salinas, and the citizens of the Al South elected not to do it. So for a period of time, I guess some of the elders of the Al Sal district thought, well, we're going to have our own city of Al Sal. But then they had a second election, and Al Sal did join Salinas. But during the decade that I was living out here, it was wonderful. Uh, how did we pass the time? Well, we went to school, and we played baseball, and we played football, and we did it in the streets, and we did it at Fremont School. And we did whatever we did, and life was simple and it was pure. And one of the other misnomers about the Al Sal was that we were the dumb Okies. And if you remember the history, John Steinbeck coined that phrase if I had my history correct. And yes, a whole bunch of folks came from Oklahoma, and a whole bunch of folks came from Texas, which we did. And a whole bunch of folks came from Arkansas. I know that because you look upon as the Okies. When I look back at my dad's business when he lost it, I even have a deed of a ranching one in 1928 in Texas. So he, like a lot of people, and I'm sure Jim's family, we were not the dumb Okies. We were uh, part of the Great Depression. We just got to have lost so many things. My family lost it too. But the, the uh, the pressure of the dust bowl is a little different. You know, to go with quick history, we killed all the buffalo and we moved the Indians off the country. We plowed all the ground in the Midwest and we had a drought. Not, not necessarily of that combination of events, but all of that happened. So the consequence of no water and a lot of plowing and First World War we did the dirt in, hence the dust. And then over time, through a lot of education, they corrected that problem and, and that were open product. In 1950, I was still living in the Al Sal and I had started hiding down and didn't like school much. I was better playing football, by the way, than I was <laughs> being a student. So I joined the Navy in 1951. Hard Nellon, the Navy. And the world in Salinas now has all changed between the time I left in 1951 and came back in 1955. There was a change in population in the El Sal. There was a change in movement. There had been some development because after the Second World War, the city of Salinas began to develop. And so it was. I think I have to stop there and let Jim talk about his tenure in the El Sal. Do you have any questions?
Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, it's interesting when I drive around in Palo Alto, the various places we lived, I'm just flooded with memories of uh, childhood memories. Some friends and instructors that are right here th uh, today, El Gibalizio, the great coach that we had then, great mentor for all of us, and a fellow classmate, Augie Skornienke, who talked about, uh, talk about a success story of coming out of Alisa, went on to become superintendent of schools in Alameda County, and Bob Sarwell became superintendent of schools, what, over in, uh, in Santa Clara County, wherever it was, and Everett Alvarez, of course, you all know his history. So anyway, it was the great memories of the great folks that I, that I grew up with here. But our family came, uh, as Bill said, we, we came during the Dust Bowl era, and uh, they, my father came out, they came from Arkansas, and the uh, first year they came out was 1935, and uh, I'm the youngest of four boys, I'm the only one that was born in California. Three other boys were born in Arkansas. <clears throat> so each time at the end of each season, you know, working in the fields, they would go back home and, during the winter, and whatever empty seats they had, they brought cousins with them, or uncles, <laughs> or brothers. <laughs> So the transition took from 1935 to 1941, in which my grandmother and grandfather finally decided that their whole family had moved out to Salinas or to Alsa, and that they had no family left. So they followed and came out in 1941. So uh, I was born in, in Salinas, at, uh, down on the corner where downtown Chevron actually was on the corner of Monterey and San Luis streets. Uh, a lot of people don't know it. There was the Salinas Valley Hospital was there, and that was the uh, Dr. Reeves's hospital. Yeah. And so I was born on that spot. But we lived all over outside, and I went to Sherwood School, and then we were the first class through El Sasal Junior High School. The first seventh grade, which was 1949, then the first eighth grade, and then the first ninth grade. And we were very upset about being. Uh, having to spend three years in school because I think Washington Junior High before that, correct me if I'm wrong, was only seventh and eighth grade. So we were looking forward to being freshmen in high school and we weren't allowed to. We were three years at, uh, at El Sasal Junior High. So ultimately when it went down to, it went down to Salinas High and uh, my particular case is a little <laughs> Uh, it was a little unusual in as much as uh, I was married very young at age 15. We grew up pretty pretty fast out here. I was driving a lettuce truck at age 14 in my, and lied to get my license. And my my uh, brothers had taught me how to do it. And we were driving a truck. And so I dropped out of school and I didn't go to high school in my junior year. <clears throat> I was working at nighttime at Greyhound. And uh, I finally realized one night about 2 in the morning when I was loading luggage in the rain, you know, I better go back and at least get a high school education. I don't want to do this. And so I went back and was able to finish with, uh, with my class in 1955, and I took both years in one, the junior and senior year, and worked at the bus station at night time doing that. So I graduated with my class, and recently at a class reunion, the class president said, I'm confused because I'm looking into your book, and you're in both the junior class and the senior class. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so the um, so we in our family, I'm the first one to graduate high school. We broke that cycle, and the unusual uh, part about it, of course, is that I had a pregnant wife and a son sitting in the audience when we lived. <laughs> So we got a, got a pretty early start there, and uh, went on, and I've been, I've been fortunate uh, in done all sorts of different things, different businesses, and been involved in all kinds of different nonprofit activities. And it's uh, been a wonderful range of experiences for me. And uh, uh, it's really been, uh, been a wonderful ride, but I go back to the roots here in Alisal and uh, our family, and I think about that. And this was a destination for us. You know, this wasn't just a transitory place. This was, this was uh, what we were looking for, I mean, my family coming from Arkansas. They were looking for a place that uh, my father never made enough money to 
to buy his own house, and I had my brothers and I put it together later on and bought him a house near Foster Park later later in their lives. But um, and we all uh, pitched together and built my grandmother and grandfather a house over on Police Street. And so everybody was a carpenter or a mechanic in those days, and things were a lot simpler. But well, we all worked together. <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, a lot of pride. Uh, family was uh, my family was very very good. We we never had any money, but my parents had two things. It was their their children and their church, and that was uh, they were Baptists. And I was I was. Uh, 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 I was a member of the Hebron Heights Missionary Baptist Church, and I was baptized at the top of the hill on Market Street over there, <laughs> across from Wings Market. <laughs> so anyway, uh, a lot of a lot of fond memories and, and uh, wonderful times. I think, and, and Carol had mentioned once about what do you think historically has changed about Al and I think a couple of things changed it certainly demographically. Um, the number one thing, the technological thing in agriculture, when there was a switch from packing in the sheds to field pack. And because all of my aunts and uncles and brothers and so forth, they worked in sheds or drove trucks in, in, the, in the agricultural. I didn't see them doing any stoop labor. The, the fields were half uh, Proceros and half Filipinos when I was driving a left truck. And, and when we went through that transition, it became field pack. It was and the Bracero program went away. The combination of those two changed the, the demographics in Alabama considerably, and it took a little time to do that. I'm not sure how long the transition, was. but uh, it was home to us. It was uh, a place we were comfortable. It was people that we were all sharing the same experiences, and it was really pretty nice. <laughs> Well, first, let me just say that um, I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, these are some incredible um, leaders and people that have have, um, have contributed tremendously to the, to the city of Salinas. And um, to hear their stories really is, is wonderful because I don't think it's changed that much, honest to goodness. Um, I, I, I moved to Salinas. My, my background is I, I grew up in Southern California, and I, I was... Um, uh, a, a child of the civil rights movement, and so I was really inspired to go to law school and to um, move to Salinas to work with farm workers, and that's really how I got here. Uh, I ex expected to move to Salinas, work here a couple of years, and then move back down where my family was located in Southern California, and I fell in love with the community. So my first apartment was living on Seaver Street, and um, I lived there for a year, decided to make a, a commitment, and I bought a house, and I lived over here on Carriage Drive, right next to the Ocampos, and, um, and, and lived there for about 11 years. And um, what happened is that, is that I went to law school because I wanted to help pe give people legal advice and help them to change their life. And what I realized is that um, you can do it much more, have much bigger impact if you get involved politically. And so what happened is, we started looking around, and there were a lot of vacant properties. There were a lot of single homes, small 800 square foot homes that were being um, removed, and a, an apartment, um, a concrete pad was put with apartments going sideways, and it was creating a congestion and a change in the neighborhoods that many of us felt concerned about. Um, and so we started looking around to figure out um, Who's on the city council? Who's on the school board? Um, what's happening in our neighborhood that we don't know about? And, um, and it, oh, and, and in the interim, what had happened is, and I think one of the biggest myths um, that's out there is that, is that the Alistair was created by the city of Salinas and that it was, it was neglected and, um, and it was a segregated uh, community. But that's not really true. I mean, you heard the history. It, it was a county unincorporated area that started off very rural and, and very rustic. And as people came in the different waves, um, they built their homes. They started subdividing the properties. And, um, and it, it was um, back before the apartments, there were a lot of single-family homes, one right after another. Um, and, 
it, it's a lot less dense when you have single family homes. And um, what happened is that as people um, had the opportunity to leave, I think, um, and investors came in and wanted to, to, um, to create rental units, is they started putting these concrete um, boxes, really. It, it, there's, no, there's no street trees. There, there isn't enough parking. And so it, it started creating this density. Um, and then along with all of that, quite frankly, um, Soledad Prison was built. And um, Soledad Prison initially housed very uh, low-level offenders. Uh, and at one point, and I don't know what the, the timing was, but at one point it shifted and they started, um, they changed it and they brought in the high-risk offenders, which were the people that were sentenced there for very serious crimes. And so you had murders, attempted murders, robberies. And um, what that did is it brought the families who wanted to be closer to the prisoners. And I think that, that level of, of uh, crime in the, in the region really created challenge, has created challenges for, for the surrounding area because um, that it, it, it professionalized the, the gangs and the little wars, warring factions and uh, groups that, um, that were involved in, in criminal behavior. So, so part of this is this transition, and you, you hear about the transition, but what happened when, when people started changing out the single family homes for, for apartments is that it, um, it, it created challenges because county unincorporated areas don't, you, or don't usually worry about curbs, gutter, sidewalks, and streetlights. So those aren't the things that, that are built to city standards. And so what happened is that, um, is that you ended up with a whole area uh, of, of the community that looked very different from the downtown area. And, um, and so there, there was this distinction of, of, a, of a community that had been planned, which is the South Salinas community, as opposed to a community in, in LSL that was changing and when there was no plan. And um, that's really how I got involved in politics, is that um, we started a, a democratic club in order to try to get people to um, end up on school boards. Um, we also started at the same time an LSL betterment committee and that and we called, it was the ABC. The ABC was made up of a really diverse group of individuals. Um, Jerry Carnes, myself, my husband, Juan Uranga, um, uh, McGregor Eddy. There were a number of us that were, that were on that, uh, the ABC. And what we did is we started interviewing candidates. We wanted to know what are, what, what's, what are your priorities? What are you going to do in the LSL? What do you want to see happen here? And, um, and that beginning of political activity led us to believe that it was important to have district elections in the city of Salinas because no one on the city council um, actually lived in, in, in East Salinas any longer. And so we wanted to have some representation. So those were political movements that started changing um, the dynamics of, of what, were, what was happening. And um, I think in the end it was really important because the zoning in this area was 40 units per acre, which is the highest, you, you never get 40 units per acre uh, in, a, in a rural community, but it was really um, destabilizing the community because we had no parks, um, or relatively few parks, and it turns out that Park is really the, the biggest park. Um, and it, it, we didn't have open space, it was difficult to play on the streets now because you had uh, a lot more traffic. Um, it became uh, the only in entrance and exits from the city was um, was um, on Laurel and then also on um, uh, Alisal and uh, John Street. And so there was this need to kind of um, integrate the Alisal in with the rest of the community. So there were a lot of a lot of um, priorities that um, we set on the council based on some of the challenges that having. And annex, annexing a county unincorporated to a city um, uh, is, it, it is required if you're really going to have people feel like it's important to, to have everybody feel good. So the, the biggest challenge is kind of overcoming the myths, but the other biggest challenge is to get people, because um, the immigration that's occurred between 1965 and, and now is from Mexico, um, there are language issues, there's culture issues, and there's, um, there's the issue with having people feel like they really belong in the community. Um, and that has to do with um, people may not be documented, and so they're afraid, they're scared, they, 
um, uh, they're, they don't feel like they can participate in a, in a political arena. And, um, and part of what I've tried to do over the years, and we did it through Partners for Peace, a nonprofit focused on reducing gang violence, was to have the community, like, have the members of the community feel like they were part of, of the bigger community, and uh, we did a number of activities to try to make that happen. So I want to stop because I know we want to get some right, questions and, and have a discussion. We do want to have a discussion. I just want to, uh, my historian's uh, uh, voice is shouting in my head. Um, you are talking about a lot in a lot of decades. So you arrived here in what year? I, re I arrived here in 1979. Okay, so we're talking about the 80s, of this, this big transitional era of the 80s. So what we heard from the panel is that in the 20s, this is a very sparsely settled place, uh, mostly ranches. And then the twin catastrophes of the 1929 depression, the crash, followed by the 1933 um, environmental catastrophe of the Dust Bowl, which really devastated the Southwest and sent a huge wave of refugees to California and elsewhere, um, led to a new population in the Alicel. But this population has been caricatured in some ways as not very intelligent or whatever. And what we see is a really um, consistent settlement pattern that um, is, is suggests that the Alicel was always populated by people who were aimed to own a home, aimed to start small businesses, aimed to move up the socioeconomic ladder. That is the consistency. And the problems that um, Assembly Member Caballero has pointed out um, are fairly recent, but the population, the goals, the values of the population seems to be consistent to me. Uh, we're all the same people. So with that in our mind's eye, I'd like to invite the audience to come up and um, share your stories and ask questions of this wonderful panel that is so rich in history um, of this special place. Bless you. Does anyone, would anyone like to start? Yeah, I've got a question about uh, the physical separation of the south from the east. The, the railroad always set, has separation, but you could drive across it. You still can in some places. But then, this probably happened after you left the Al-Sal, but there was a freeway that came by and reinforced that, that physical separation. And I wonder what your recollections are of how that happened and what impact it had on Selena. And when it happened. I don't think that would have anything much to do with it. Early 50s. I'm not sure that freeway came through about middle to 
So the formal annexation right takes now. place in 1963, yeah. and uh, Anna, you're talking about the 1980s when this overbuilding happens sure. and when this, the impact of the prison happens. So that's the 1980s. That's when you started reconsidering politically. I think Anna hit, really hit upon something about the prisons. That was a dramatic change in the makeup of the game. Uh, whatever happened, uh, the greatest of the ten to have a person take care of those that need to go to prison. But the consequences, the unintended consequences, were an only for So that was that was a big turning point. <laughs> Questions, comments, stories. I want to hear your stories. Don't be shy, and unlike Peter, come up to the microphone so we can record you. <laughs> Tell us your name. Uh, my name is Edward Moncrief. And, uh, uh, Edward, would you like to use the microphone? Thank you. Um, we started Chispa in 1980, and we started by finding what was then the most um, rundown block in the, in the city, and uh, that was the street of Madeira between Market and LSL. And that is one place where many of the migrants came in the 30s, and they put up tents, and after a year or two, they were able to build some rather modest 15 by 15 structures. Monterey construction, as they called, and those structures were still there in 1980, um, occupied mostly by uh, Mexican immigrant farm workers. And there was 39 homes on the block between Market and Roosevelt Street and up the hill. Where you were <laughs> living, I guess. And um, so we started buying up parcels. And uh, the folks that we bought the parcels from lived over in Carmel or wherever they live. But, um, I just have a couple of quick stories. One is that um, one of those parcels had an heir who had to sign off. So I had to track down where this person was, and we didn't have Google back then. <laughs> and uh, we finally came up with an address over in. Um, Los Banos, and the gentleman with his wife was living in the trader court in Los Banos, and we drove over there, my family and I, on a very, very hot July day, and went to the trader court, and I had to leave my two boys and wife in the car, and Judy, and went over to the trader door, and I knocked on the door, and the door opened, and here was this 70 to 80-ish, very wiry, tough-looking woman, and this 70 to 80-ish, very wiry, thin, tough-looking guy. And they said, come on in. So I sat at the table with this couple, and they started telling me their story. And first of all, I have to say, they were chain-smoking, Lucky Strike cigarettes without any filters. <coughs> and uh, the gentleman says, well, you know, I, I come out there and sometime in the early 30s, and I put my tent on that piece of property, me and my wife, not this one, my other wife. <laughs> and we, we lived there for a few years, and we finally were able to build something, and I spent many a good year on that, on that block. Um, and it was, it was just wonderful to see them see the era and see the folks who are still out there, who are still out there, and, uh, and to meet someone who had uh, helped settle the yellow cell. Uh, the second very quick story is that when we bought the uh, auto dismantling yard from Mr. Eli Boozer, uh, which was between Roosevelt and Ellis South Street, uh, it was called the junkyard by most people, but it was an auto dismantling yard. Um, we bought that block um, where the cliff is, if you will, uh, 
And we, um, we found out that when the uh, folks did the measuring across from Roosevelt to Alisal, one, one, one uh, surveyor went this far, and the other surveyor <laughs> went this far, and so there were two parcels that did not connect. And underneath, there were owners that owned three feet of land <laughs> along the whole block, <laughs> and several of them. And we had to go find those people and get them to sign off and pay them whatever they required. But it was just very interesting that back then the well, survey was Beyond interesting. It's important because I think what Anna was saying was that there was a critical difference between part being part of a city um, neighborhood and being part of a county and not having the benefit of county interest or city interest and funds for infrastructure, which is problematized in the 1980s, not so much in the early period. It didn't seem to matter. Your dad supplied water for people. If they didn't have water access, he just gave it to them. And in the 30s and 40s, people came and built homes and didn't really worry over much about the little trivial legalities, right? So it's only in the 1980s that we see some concern. This is 20 years after incorporation, or at 20 years after annexation, that there's concern that there is this overbuilding, there are populations coming in that need housing that can't find it. So, um, Anna, I'm trying to understand, like, when you got involved in politics, what were your policy options? What were your decisions that you had to make with the city council? When were you elected to city council? And what did you try to do to alleviate what is now turning into a problem? in the 1980s. It wasn't a, so much of a problem before. Even though Jim and Bill have told me stories about getting into fights, that was different. <laughs> that was different than what you found in the 1980s. That was pretty serious. So what were, what were some of the actions that you took as a policymaker to, to make change? Well, I ended up on the planning commission between 85 and 89, and what we started doing was um, we rezoned the area and um, and prohibited the kind of developments that were happening, and um, and then started looking at changing some of the zoning in the area so that there wouldn't be as much housing, but there would be commercial opportunities because that was part of the challenge is that you had a, a lot of little stores, but not of the bigger stores once you got past the, what used to be the Monty Mart. And, um, and, and uh, part of what we were doing was trying to figure out how we were going to change the traffic patterns because it was hard to get around. Um, once you got out here to the Alisal, now everybody thinks, oh, you just jump on Freedom Parkway or, or Barand Road, but those didn't exist back then. And so Laurel was, was pretty congested. And, um, and we wanted to, to try to, uh, for the city as a whole, there were a number of things happening. One, one is it was mentioned that that um, that there was there was a change in the in the way that um, ag production was happening. But what also happened is the value added really took off, and and that that was the ability to use to have the breathable bags, the salad. Um, so, um, and I'm not the best person to be talking about about agriculture, but it, it's been it's interesting to me and it's it fascinating because. Um, when I first got to Salinas, they were when they were growing head lettuce, um, they would pick maybe a third of the field and then they disc the rest under. And I'd be paying two bucks a head for lettuce, and I'd look out the window and go, "Oh my God, they're disking it! Let me run out there and grab a couple heads of lettuce. I, I want to, I, you know, I want to get it for free. They're just <laughs> disking it under, and um, and it, it ended up that that those heads." Were, were not packaged in the field. They were brought in and they were wrapped and put into boxes um, in, in a processing facility. The ones that were just no, the ones that were picked. Oh, oh. But, but then, what, then what happened is that once they developed the, the breathable bag, um, they, they would go through and pick the, well, the breathable bag and also the ability to, to, to pack in the field. So the head gets cut and it gets wrapped and put in the box and it hits the cooler within 20 minutes. But then the rest 
um, is thrown in the back of a truck. It's taken down to a processing facility and they chop it up. It doesn't matter whether, what they were doing is picking the prettiest heads because that's what we want. But the ones that weren't as pretty, they were just disking under. And so instead, they were getting chopped up, put into a bag, and now you pay three times what you would have paid for the head of lettuce. And But that really revolutionized because it created all these jobs in the packing facilities, and it also created no waste in the field, which meant a lot more work for people. So we needed um, more workers, but we also needed them to be around year-round. So there was a lot less migrant um, stream coming through the city. And so as a policymaker, the challenge we have always had is the lack of affordable housing. And, um, and that's been kind of my number one issue for 20 years. I got on the city council in 1990, no, 1991, I'm sorry, 1991. And, um, and, and the issues that we were facing were, uh, were affordable housing, lack of open space. We doubled the park space um, at, when I was on the council. We had a real need for economic development and the car dealers wanted to be, be located in town and they wanted to be located together and um, they were required to have new facilities. And the only way they could get that was if they moved to new facilities. They, they, their, their parent companies were requiring them to have the latest technology. And so they were either going to stay in Salinas and we were going to make land available or they were going to move somewhere else. And so it's, it is pressure and they generate Pertinere, I think, between 20 and 25 percent of the sales tax in the city, and that's that's really important. I think the the underscore of all of this is the hardest thing about being the mayor of Salinas is that we never ever have enough revenue. We have a very young population, somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 is our median age, and um, and our our revenue is significantly below per capita um, communities surrounding us, um, and that includes Watsonville, Delroy. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, Monterey had more than four times the amount per capita. San Jose had uh, twice the per capita. And so we always struggled e economically because with, with young people, you have a lot of needs. You have, you have library needs, you have park needs, you have school needs. And we were trying to meet all of that um, at a time when the budget, the state budget was going up and down. And it was very, very hard um, under good circumstances. And, was harder than, yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned the age of the population, and Sam Pacheco, I'm going to embarrass you and make you come up here, because you teach students at Hartnell, many of whom live in LSL. What are your biggest, do you agree with what you've heard here? Uh, you, I know you teach California history, so do you have a comment or question that you can come up and share with us? Well, come up. Come up is the key word. <laughs> <laughs> the key word. There's the mic, Sam. <laughs> I'm going to make you do this. You can do this. You come up. Anyway, I really want to know about Pat. Uh, where did your family come here? Where did your dad come from? Well, my father was born in San Francisco. My mother was born right on the corner of Pajaro and Harvest Street in Salinas. When she grew up, they moved to Berkeley, and my dad's family moved back to Prunedale. I'm liking, why why has Alice Al got such a name? And Prunedale has been a, 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 a kind of a wing of Salinas all these years. But the Alice Al always, because it's the left, the east side, they always put it down. And uh, so my dad uh, went to work for the post office when they got, they got married in 1922. And he worked for the post office. That's where his family lived on Harvest Street. They used to have, right where the senior citizen building is now, there was a great big three story house. That's for my father's family. There were seven in the family. My grandmother came from Sweden when she was 13, and my grandfather came from uh, Medina, Illinois, uh, uh, with his father. Great grandfather on top was out in the, in the uh, Prunedale, raised. Honey and bees. But didn't your family originate in, in Denmark? Mm -hmm. Was your family not, didn't they not originate in Denmark, uh, Sweden? No, in Sweden. My, my Sweden, yeah. And my grandmother was born in Sweden. 
Right. I've gone back to see where she was born. Oh, yeah, wonderful. She was wonderful. Yeah, so she, and she raised seven children, five boys and two girls there on Harvard Street. I have a lot of questions. Go for it. So we're working with uh, some of my students, we're working to do research, helping uh, Carol, and we're going through the Hartnell yearbooks, and I'm going to look at you guys. I went to Hartnell when you were... Class of 42. Okay, I'll look at that. <laughs> uh, but one thing that, that I find out looking, that look like kids of different ethnicities got mm -hmm. along oh. pretty well. I went to the LSSL school with Bill Chinaman. We called him Chinaman. Yeah. Chinese boys, and uh, we were very, and, and Japanese. The Masuda family used to live off of the Sanborn Road down on the Machado property, and we were very dear friends with all of them. There was no, none of this racial stuff. So it was everybody. But one thing I did find through the research was that we're going through the 1928 yearbook for Salinas High School. And you know how they do advertisements for companies or just restaurants? And there was one restaurant, actually I take it back to 1937, that basically was promoting that their hired staff is all white. And it was called Ray's, and I think it was off the solid that like a diet. So what I, I was trying to figure out what was that like, because I saw Japanese American students that were hanging out with white students, it looked like a basketball coach in <coughs> high school was, you know, baseball coach was Japanese in 1930. Oh, yeah, so you have all this types of very, very smart. Very smart. But you're making a, a good point about racial definitions in those years that were really, really, this is before World War II, this is before the Holocaust, people really did believe in racial hierarchies. And we had very strict legislation about race and space. And, but what you found also in the high school, in the Hartnell yearbook, that I thought was important um, you found a Filipino club mm -hmm. at Hartnell. So our assumption that all Mexican origin immigrants were laborers, all Filipino immigrants were laborers, is really a little oversimplified. That we need to pay attention to difference within groups. We need to look at not just class, but also, um, well, we need to look at not just race, but also class within within races and look that and understand that there wasn't this homogeneity that we assume for other people. Um, yeah. Actually that's real important because we, we you have to contextualize it. Um, I had a neighbor when I lived um, over on Carriage Court who, um, Manuel Luz was his name, and a, a Filipino who worked in the fields, who started his career working in the fields. And he was real. He was older than I am, than I was. I was in my 20s, and he was 80 years old. And he told me that he um, that he was really proud of the fact that I was an attorney, because he always wanted to be an attorney, but they wouldn't let him go to law school. And um, that always struck me. Um, I mean, I felt very sad for him because he was really proud of the change. In, in society, but that he was prohibited from getting an education, and, and he was, it had always been his dream when he came from the Philippines. So, so um, we got along very well. He was considered a friend of ours, um, and the oldest Filipino club in California, I believe, is the Filipino Women's Club here in, in Salinas. Um, and so uh, there, there are, have been these organizations that have um, been around for a really long time and have... Um, they, they really, one of the members of, it, of the club was um, Connie Sonico, who was an elected official for many, many years, Hart, actually a Hartnell uh, College trustee. Um, so there were opportunities, but it, I think through the fraternal organization sometimes it made it possible for them to, to be successful, step out and go do, do things as well. That's true, but it's, and it's also, um, what you're pointing out also is something that you pointed out earlier and that everyone kind of alluded to and it wasn't that Alisal was a segregated space. Uh, it was segregated all right but based on class not on race and I think we assume segregation based on race. There was segregation based on race in Salinas, absolutely. But um, Alisal was not one of those places and when you describe it in the years of the 20s, 30s and 40s what you describe is a place of Dust Bowl settlement, uh, refugees from the Dust Bowl, and also Asian settlement. Uh, that Asian migration was completely cut off in the teens and 20s. But uh, people had already arrived and had generation generationally 
uh, settled here. And so you settled in LSL when you were on the move upward, right? That was your first home. But it wasn't something that you were forced to do be, uh, because of race. And that was an important distinction. My name's Robin Cohen, and um, I kind of lost track of who was, uh, lived through which generations as a kind of, they'd be old enough to remember, so I'll just put this out generally. So I'm just wondering, what was it like in Salinas when the Japanese families were rounded up and brought to uh, the rodeo ground? What, how did people react? How anybody who was there, how did your family react? And how, to school well, the next morning and there were no, none of your Japanese friends were there. That's, That's all we knew. Well, where did they go? Well, but I mean, was there any activism? Did people respond? Is, is there solidarity? Did people well, just they, they feel like, I guess, I mean, you know, here we were. Use the microphone, please. <coughs> Can I bend it up? Oh, yes. oh, sure. oh, so my question is, was there, it happened, so, but did, was there any organizing or solidarity or activism in the community of acts of solidarity, of sympathy, or was it just like, well, I guess this is what's happening, and we're at war, this has, I don't know. How did you, how did, you probably weren't alive, but when Pearl Harbor came, and uh, you heard that, that we were bombed by the Japanese, the first thing you thought of was up to the enemy. But the Germans were not thought of that way, and that's that's the strange thing in the United States. When, uh, you, you have, when I went to school at Fremont School, war began. I was in fourth grade. Uh, I had a couple of Japanese friends, and a couple of Hispanic or Mexican friends, but the most of us were these Caucasian Okies from Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas. Those are the people I know, knew. And yes, I had one or two good Japanese friends. And I didn't really question where they went. I knew what happened in the Rodale Grant. I saw that. And I saw my friends when the war came back. But during the war, there was no upheaval about our Japanese friends, or our German friends, or our Italian friends. We were just living. And the war came along, so Two of my brothers went into the military. One became an aerial gunner and a torpedo bomber. One was killed in Korea as a first lieutenant, and one was bombing Japan as a third brother-in-law on a B-29 as a navigator. So it was just a time there was no separation or no hatred that I knew that I experienced. It wasn't that way. It was pretty, pretty well documented. Uh, and Salinas was the city that uh, California policymakers kind of looked to to see what was going to happen. It was pretty well documented that there was a, an almost universal um, support for the internment of the Japanese. It was a policy that was carried out really systematically. Not only were there almost no voices speaking out against that, um, but people were pretty united that it was the right thing to do and enormously fearful that California was going to be bombed any second. Uh, there were blackouts, there was a lot of hysteria, there were Chinese people in Salinas who had been shot on the street because they were mistaken for Japanese. So Chinese people started wearing buttons that said, I am Chinese, because they were so fearful. And uh, there was a lot of um, confusion about what to do with Germans and Italians. But because they were perceived as whites, there was a lot less fear. One judge said something to the effect that, well, we know when we look in the eyes of an Italian person or a German person if they're a good guy or a bad guy, but we can't tell with the Japanese, so they all have to go. And very, very few Japanese, including the Japanese American Citizen League, which was supposed to be supporting uh, their own people, objected to the internment. Uh, in fact, the one person who stood up and said no, Fred Korematsu, who is now considered a hero, he sued the US government, uh, and successfully to a point, um, 
was ostracized when he was forced into the camps. He, uh, his girlfriend, who was Caucasian, suggested that he have plastic surgery to change his eyes, and he did, but that didn't fool anyone. So he was interned, and he was really stigmatized in the camps for, re for, for rebelling. So to answer your great question, um, there was almost a unanimous support for that policy initiative. Unfortunately, it's a shameful period in American history, and it has yet to really be uh, right. and challenged. And so I'm just yeah. bringing it up because when I hear it, Yeah, like, but everybody here harmony. were children. I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. when you hear there is harmony, I think there is an undercurrent right. that's not really being addressed. Right, my, yeah. My other question is, at that time, in, in my understanding is that when the Japanese were interned, there was a, a mad uh, land rush for their holdings. Uh, that's so, not quite true. That's not quite true. Um, there was there was a lot of loss of property, but there were people who protected property for their neighbors too. Right, I'm sure there Handful. were exceptions. Handful, yeah, exceptions. I'm, I'm sure yeah. there were exceptions, but I imagine that there yeah. was a great transfer of resources here in the community, right? Must be documented. Yeah. <coughs> you know, when, when Jim and I grew up here in Alabama, and you heard him? When we grew up in, uh, in Salinas, there was only one high school. I told Carol this last week. We came from Santa Rita, from the Santa Rita School District. We came from San Bonanza, from San Bonanza District. We came from Castroville, in the elementary district. We came from Al Sal in the elementary district. And we melted at the Salinas High School. That was, and, and that's the way it was. And now, when some of you live here, and you see the high school here in Alabama, high school in North Carolina, high school here and high school in high school there, there was no racial tension. Did you ask that what you wanted to say? Okay. So it, it didn't exist. The only time I ran into a racial thing, when my wife and I got married in 1951, my wife would have been a graduate. Girl. I know, but she made a good choice. Yeah, she was, <laughs> yeah, she was, yeah. And so and, and so we went. I joined the Navy, and when I got out of boot camp, I got stationed in Memphis, Tennessee, and that's the first time I had ever experienced. Um, uh, so I looked and I saw a world from a different one that I grew up in. I was wondering if you remember, if anybody knows about this, um, in when Pearl Harbor had been uh, the bombing in Japanese. I grew up in Monterey, but it, this was before I was born. There were a lot of people, fishermen in Monterey, and yeah, and a lot of them were taken out of their homes in Monterey, brought to Salinas to live because they thought the Japanese people thought that they were spies. Yes. Do you remember that? Well, I don't remember that. Thank God, I was not well, born yet. But, right. but I'm in it. But I do know about that. Yes. And. Uh, the difference between that policy with Germans and Italians and Japanese is that with the Italians and the Germans, it was systematically, I mean, with the uh, Japanese, it was very systematically carried out. All Japanese people were interned, whether you were a citizen or not. That's the horror of it. For the Italian community and the German community, it tended to be, if you were elite, uh, elite members, if you were involved in politics, you might have been arrested. There was an uneven carrying out of policy. Um, many Italian families in Monterey didn't get to get were not clear on the concept of having to move off the coast, and some of them just moved to San Francisco without penalty, which was on the coast, right? They were supposed to move off the coast. They knew they had to move, um, and there was attention paid to whether or not you were a citizen or not. So if you were an American citizen and you were of Italian origin, then you really didn't have much to fear. 
And the problem was that within families there were many non-citizens. So it was an uneven policy for Italians and Germans. It was very, very carefully carried out for Japanese. That was the big difference. And so it was pretty devastating. But it was devastating for everyone. It was a confusing time. Um, and, you know, we all understand racism. It's very hard to see racism, especially when it's direct, not directed at you. If it's not directed at you, then it's easier to say it doesn't exist. If it's directed at you, then you notice things. So I think that that might be the difference um, yeah. in Salinas. There was certainly racism in Salinas and continues to be, but it's harder to perceive if you're not um, of the group that's being um, treated treated badly. But yeah, that is a story. That is an important story. And Anji, you are investigating that. Yes, that's a story. Uh, okay, I've been, please. I've been chopping at the bits here. I'm Anji Scornianke. I grew up on Del Monte Avenue. Went to school in Al Sal. Went to school at Al Sal with Jim Salinas High, and I'm a Hartnell graduate. Uh, and I've uh, I've seen uh, two attempts to tell the story of Alicell, and the Italian American is left out. And and when we grew up, when I grew up, I, I we had a, a, a mom and pop store on, on Del Monte Avenue. I won't leave. All up in Williams, Sanborn, there were Italian stores, Italian American stores. Our our migration pattern was not, was a little bit longer than yours. Uh, we, many of the Italians that ended up in Salinas grew up in a small village in southern Italy, affected by the Depression. And southern Italy was really wiped out. Moved to Chicago and then to Salinas. That was our pattern. So a lot of people from our village settled in Al Sal and Salinas. What village? Uh, Pianigrate, which is by Cosenza, southern Italy. So uh, that role of the Italian American grocer was is not told, and it hasn't been told in two stories. I can remember being on Del Monte Avenue, a knock on the door, we lived behind the store in the house, at midnight that an Oki or an Arky or a Texan needed milk or an aspirin or bread, my dad would get up, go in the store, and give that to him. And that was pretty typical of the Italian grocery stores along here. Uh, it, we, we were part of that pattern, and I get upset when it's not told. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. That was an important story, and we did get along, and in the hierarchy, I think we were a little bit above the Texans and the people from Oklahoma. Peace Market on Del Monte Avenue. Well, 55. We delivered uh, groceries out on Osage Road to some of the ranchers. We might have delivered to your... Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, were you uh, with the records? Were no, they... Scorny Yankees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there were there were stores on probably eight or nine Italian stores. Uh -huh. And then when Safeway came in, they wiped us all out. Yeah. Uh -huh. What year was that? Uh, when Sa uh, we had the store from 1947 to 19, I think it was in, I'll stop 53. Oh, that's why I didn't know your family. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen Cameron. Oh, wait, is that Karen? Can you hang on to it? Sure. Interesting enough, my father had a little grocery store that was there up from Roosevelt and Wood Street. So he knows that area well. I know those little areas that you were talking about, those little 15 by, I know those places well. But, um, you know, it's very typical of what you see when a lot of fairly new people come in. There's mom and pop stores that pop up all over. And I remember we went down there, and I remember when my brothers and aunts and uncles, we poured the concrete, stood the walls, and put, you know, had no money, so it was metal, corrugated metal on the exterior of the building, as well as the ceiling. I don't even think the walls were insulated or anything. And we just sold to all of our neighbors, you know, so it was, and I remember arguing with, you know, Gerald, I may tell one yeah, story of my yeah. dad, though. I don't know if you remember, we had those long... He used a microphone. With the, with the, uh, the yes, uh, receipts that came in, you bought groceries, and my dad would write it down and would sign it. And you had to put your name in there, and you had the long box. Well, I, by my junior year, between my junior and senior year from college, I came home, and I'm really smart then, right? 
So I look at the book and I count it up and there's three thousand dollars in due bills. This is nineteen fifty seven. So I said, Dad, what you're crazy, let's go get it. And he says, Go get it. You can have what you want. And the people some of the people still lived in town. I knocked down three doors and the poverty was there and I gave it up. So I came home and my dad says, How did you do? And he laughed and I sat down. <laughs> third grade in the Alice Hall School District and moved here in 1974 originally when my mother, Marla Smayer, became the director of Hartnell College and I think a few of you know she worked very actively with Anna on many campaigns. Um, I had two questions. One, can anyone comment in terms of the Native American period in Salinas and also in terms of land development and growth? Clearly we're the salad bowl of the world. Um, agriculture is so pervasive, um, you know, pesticide spraying is a concern near properties and school. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on the development. You, you talk about the days when it was just fields. And now we're a whole different community. So what can you say about the, um, the planning and the, the purposeful um, decision making that went into developing this community to balance agriculture and the health of its people. Yeah, I think the um, there, there's a number, uh, there are a number of issues that, in terms of, of planning and and um, the, I, the challenge is you start with what's already been built and then you figure out what are the needs of the community and how are we going to address those needs given kind of the rules that we're that we live under in the state of california so one of my frustrations has always been that we'll we'll come up with a plan and then the school districts will decide where they're going to put their schools and they move out into ag land and they put them on the outskirts you know out in the middle of ag land and then they want everybody around all the agriculture around to change like they didn't know that it was agriculture. And the challenge is, is that the schools have the right, by law, to put the schools wherever they want to. They don't have to check in with the city. And they, and so the, the challenge is, you get complaints about why are they out on the out, outskirts, like the new, the new high school, for example. Um, that's way in the heck out there. And uh, McKinnon School, is out in the middle of Atlanta. So the challenge is, is looking at policies and trying to figure out what should happen and then other entities that can come in and do something entirely different. Now the city will, will grow out there and ag will be um, displaced eventually because there will be homes, but, um, but the, you don't control the timing of when uh, the construction happens and how things are going to happen. So, so in reality, um, Salinas, in the, Salinas is one of those cities that has really focused on not hopscotch development where you end up with ag land or fallow land and then a home's way out in somewhere else. Um, if you drive on Veranda Road, you know that if it's a house, it's city. If it's not, it's, um, it's not been annexed yet. And so some annexations will happen over the next number of years. But let me tell you some concrete things we tried to do when I was on the planning commission and on this in, in, in the city because that's a combination of about 24 years. I was on the council, well, it's about I mean, uh, 15 years on the council and almost five years on the planning commission is that um, one of the trends in Salinas was, um, well, first of all is if you wanted, if you, had a, if you, bought, if you bought something and uh, you wanted to move up into a, a larger home, you either bought it in South Salinas or you had to move out of town. That was the reality back in the 80s. Um, and I say that because I bought a small, a small um, home here in East Salinas and then our family grew and we needed more space. And if you moved to South Salinas, you paid a lot of money because it was in high demand. 
And so we prioritize the development of bigger homes, number one, to stabilize the community because people were moving out onto Highway 68 as a way to get a bigger home. And it was taking um, people who really wanted to live in Salinas and moving them out of town. And that's a brain drain in the community. And so um, that's why you see Creek Bridge and some of the development in, Northern, in North Salinas were single family homes because we wanted to stabilize the community. The other thing we wanted to do is to create traffic patterns that, that went around the community so that um, you had uh, space, you had an ability to get out of East Salinas on an alternate route and, did, and didn't have to use um, Laurel. And so that we, we, we set up that system so that you paid for the roads as you were building. And then we created a park fee and a library fee because we had a real lack of park space and a lack of, of library space. The, the reason that Cesar Chavez Library is so big is because of all, of all the fees that were paid in this region. And the reason we have a 64-acre park that joins East Salinas with North Salinas is because we needed to ameliorate the lack of park space in East Salinas. And, um, and, that's, and, and that park has yet to be finished because new development has to pay for the rest of the park, for there to be a rec center and development on there as well. So, so there were some concrete goals. The other thing is we wanted to have the auto center stay in town because they do generate important revenue. Um, and we were looking for some hotels because they also generate revenue for the city. That's really, they, they, there are no services, but, but, um, but they do provide uh, transient occupancy tax. So those were, the, those were the things. And the other part of it was a big part of Salinas is the downtown area um, because that's the heart that's where Salinas started and the, it's where the old homes and the old um, architecture is located and when the mall was built out in North Salinas it decimated um, uh, economic development in South Salinas and so we wanted to bring that back we wanted to create an opportunity for there to be um, housing in that area as well some things have been successful some have not been as successful, but that was what we were trying to do. Is and I and I think um, pe people would generally agree that bringing in the Steinbeck Center or creating it there and the um, the theaters has been um, a, a good addition to the downtown area because it, it's brought people back downtown in a way that that um, that creates a, a livable, living, breathing kind of uh, downtown. And I'm proud of that because that was that was one of the things we wanted we wanted to work with that we worked on. I tell people that that if you remember Salinas, there was a time when you could roll a bowling ball down Main Street at five o'clock in the in the evening and you, you wouldn't hit anybody or anything because it was dead. And there were homeless sleeping in the in the alcoves, um, and it was it was scary and dangerous. And it's not that way anymore, but it takes it takes years of planning and what time are you thinking? Ah, uh, let me see. That would, it was probably would have been what? what yeah, I, I would have said um, the end the eighties for the most part too. It wasn't until we we um, what we did is we did some eminent domain, which is always tough tough, and we brought in. Uh, that is when the city takes over control over property, buys it, um, sometimes forcibly without the owner's consent. And, um, and, and then we put money, we put $3 million as seed money into the Steinbeck Center because um, the fundraising efforts weren't very successful. And, um, and then set up a system where uh, the group that was working on it um, could fundraise around that. And, um, and, then, and then many of the people that are here were, were instrumental in that. Um, it, would, it took people who had a real commitment to the city to say I want to sit on this board and I'm going to raise the money and it was done all locally and that the, the plan had been to, to have a very small center and when they raised I want to say 10 million dollars they they were able to get the bigger lot uh, right there at, in uh, on one main street and that that changed the dynamics um, and brought in the theater and um, other things that are down there. So you saw the impact of um, Northridge Mall almost immediately. Well, was that was a negative impact I almost immediately. Here. I okay. Wasn't here, but, okay. But 
So I, I wasn't here, but I know that there were major spaces where I was told um, were Sears, J.C. Penney's. You, you can remember the stories better than I, because I was never, I never saw them, both on South Main and in downtown. Um, that went, that moved up to Northridge Mall, and so what it did is it kind of sucked the life out of, out of um, people spending money in South Salinas. I'm Peter Casavan. I'm an architect. I'm actually a second generation architect. My uh, father started the firm in 1949. He designed Alice Al High School, as a matter of fact, as well as North High. I have photos of that, those schools when they were just built and they were surrounded by farm fields. So one of the challenges is where do you find 40 or 50 acres within an urban fabric to build a school? So most of them are forced uh, to move out into the green fields to do that. Um, but I also think there's a, a lack of a coordination of planning. I'll get back to a question about Alice in a second. Between the city and the school districts, because um, we also designed the Abrana Meadows School District uh, for the Salinas City Elementary School District. Uh, and by the way, I do a shout to Bill uh, Ramsey. He was on that board. He was the president of that board. I saw, saw it on some of the old letterhead from that school district in my dad's files. So. But there was a lot of resistance from the city and the county as well to, to develop that Verona Meadows off of Davis Road. And one of the challenges I had for the Salinas Planning Department is, well, where did you plan on the schools being built? Because they don't, they don't talk, they don't talk to the district. So there's an opportunity there to, to coordinate that. Uh, just a comment about downtown. There are some photographs of Salinas downtown in the 20s and 30s. Uh, the streets are full of people walking, pedestrians. There's three hotels. There's signage all the way. There's many different choices. And I think uh, the Valley Center was called that for a reason. It was the center of the valley. And you could go, you could shop there. There's toy stores. There are restaurants there. And I think Salinas has really done a very poor job in planning uh, because that we had a more metropolitan vital city in the 30s than we do today. Uh, back to the Alice Al. Uh, I have a question of it because I've grown up hearing about how the Alice Al has been ignored or mistreated by the city uh, and they don't get the same things that South Salinas has done. Uh, and one of the things that happened is that there was redistrict, there was district elections and the Justice Department said we had to break up the city and the districts. And as I recall, this was after, Anna, you were elected to mayor as the first Latina mayor? No, 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 the district elections happened in 87. But you were on the, you, weren't you on the Salinas City Council? Okay. Well, one of my questions was, you know, is, is that true about the Al Sal, that they were ignored by that? And has this changed? I think it's a fairly fundamental change because the leadership got distributed uh, be between different areas in the city, what the impact on the Al Sal was for, from that. Yeah, I think the, um, the, what happened is that the district election uh, uh, vote was in 1987, and then we had our first, and, and it was successful, and then the city was divided into districts, and then the first election was 89, and that was when Simo Salinas got elected from East Salinas. But the, um, I mean, you, you raise a really good point. I, there's no question that the uh, downtown, if you look at the pictures, was more vibrant at one point. But but what happened is that, and I don't know what the timing was in terms of the development up near Sherwood, up in North Salinas. Um, I, you know, I don't know when those homes started to get built. I'm, my guess is the 50s and the after 60s. The with, after, after the war. I would have said the 50s and the 60s because they look like the style of the 50s and the 60s. But but part of what, what, what Salinas suffers from is, is, um, is a sense of Somebody else is getting a better deal than my my neighborhood or my part of the community. So there's a North Salinas, then there's an East Salinas, and there's a South Salinas. And and we, when I was on the council, we did um, uh, outreach at, at, at com community meetings in every part of town for a variety of different reasons. And everybody always thought somebody else was getting more money or more resources. And I think part of the problem is is just that there's never enough. That's why I I said you know it, we're we're a blue collar community in terms of the revenue that we have. We never have enough. And, um, and so, so the economics of the community is um, Alisal has one of the, produces one of the highest sales tax rates in the city for the size that it is. That, and if, if, you, if, you get, if, you, if you discount the auto center, 
because they're kind of an entity on their own. And you look at Northridge Mall, Westridge, and East Salinas. I think East Salinas was always the number one behind the auto center. And it, it could be different now. I, I haven't seen that data in a long time. And I think the reason is, is because East Salinas is a cash and carry economy. People, people earn a paycheck and they spend it all because the, of the, the necessity and the need. And so, and they spend it within their neighborhood. And so it's really vibrant economically. What happened when the mall came in, from my, my perspective, is that they stripped everything from South Salinas other than the grocery stores and, and the small little mom and pop places. That whole um, Department of Social Services took up that whole block where the old Sears used to be. And so you moved all of that out to Northridge. And, um, and so the challenge is, is that, is that um, trying to bring back what was lost for the downtown has become a, has always been a challenge because you're not going to get the big box retail, you're not going to get the big stores there anymore. It, it's got to be um, the kind of thing that people really appreciate and like. It's one of the reasons I don't shop in any of the major chains because I feel like I want to spend all my money on the mom and pop stores and the, and the restaurants that are, are locally operated because it, they have a hard time. And when we were doing a lot of the work in downtown Salinas, what I was told is, I was told don't bring my theater, like theaters in, nobody will go to, to the theater downtown. And don't worry about white tablecloth restaurants in, in downtown because who wants to eat in downtown when they can go to Monterey and Carmel? And that really irritated me as the mayor of Salinas. It was like, I do. Um, and I used to go to a white table cough place, I don't know if you remember it, right across from the, from the uh, train station. It was this tiny little restaurant that, that had this, was like this little hallway, but it was the best food. And people used to say, ah, oh, nobody will, and, and they, had, they, moved out of, they moved out of town. But the challenge, I think, is that, is that we really never have enough money. And, 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 you know, you look at North Salinas, the library is terrible. Um, finally, East Salinas has a great library, and it's vibrant and active and full of, full of kids all the time. The South Salinas Library needs some, some significant upgrading and some help. But, you know, you don't get that unless you, you do the fees, and then that be makes housing much more expensive because you have these fees that people have to pay. So, um, so I think the challenge is, is that we never really have enough money. And so I agree with people who say, we don't have enough money for the needs of our community, but, but, but it was always a sense of South Salinas, Salinas gets it all, and that's not really true. I think district elections have really changed um, how, how people participate on the council, but, it, but it, I think the money that, that gets spent is fairly um, evenly distributed without, throughout the community. It's just that East Salinas still suffers because they don't have the infrastructure because they were, kind of, they were built county and incorporated. And one of the reasons that some of it doesn't get done is because the property owners have to agree to put money in to get it done as well. And then and they don't want to do it. And that was always part of the challenge. I would just like to make, make a couple of comments because I've spent most of my life in business. Use that one. Use the other mic. <clears throat> And as I said, I, uh, just a couple of comments, because most of my life has been in business one, one way or another from South Salinas up to, uh, I was a hairdresser for 12 years. We had a salon across from, on South Main Street, across from uh, uh, Sears. And, and then later I had clothing stores in downtown Salinas, and then I also ended up with one in Northridge. I had two stores. So what happened is Valley Center opened up, and downtown, everyone went to Valley Center and left downtown uh, the merchants. So their answer to that was to tear all the buildings down. Uh, so we have this very narrow strip left on Main Street. They tore all the buildings on Monterey Street and on Salina Street to create parking to compete with, with uh, what was going on out in Valley Center. They also took beautiful brick buildings and put faults uh, uh, aluminum <coughs> siding on the front of it and covered them up because they wanted to be modern and look like what was what was going on in Valley Center. Valley Center was a game changer and it was one of the first big outdoor retail areas in the state of California about 1949-1950 along in there. Then subsequently 
you know, Northridge built <laughs> and Guts Valley Center. <laughs> but in the meantime, downtown is struggling and has this very narrow commercial street there. Yeah. That it, it's sad that there's no depth to it. <clears throat> What's encouraging is it's really coming back now because people are still looking for uh, a shopping experience and a, a dining experience. And Taylor's building has been a, a godsend and, and the theater and the Steinbeck Center. So I'm very optimistic about downtown and what I see is going on down there. We're starting to get the density of what we need is some market rate housing down there. And because there's a lot of employees in the county and, and the schools and, the, and uh, the Taylor Farms and so forth. And uh, I know that they're in the process of trying to do that and put, put some housing up on some of the parking lots and you will get the density of that work. And then one other comment on the Steinbeck Center. When we finished fundraising for the Steinbeck Center, we had raised all the money it took to build that building, and we left pledges. We had, you know, we, we had paid for 10 or 12 million, and we had pledges for two or three million. What happened is they never met the operational projections that they had. They started using the pledges to support operations, and that's how the city ended up being short, is because they used the pledges for the building to cover operations for a while because it never met the projections that uh, originally was set for. Uh, Jim could sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> but he, he has done all the things he's talked about. Incredibly successfully so. Uh, Sleaze is changing and business is also. As Peter well knows, he's born in high school down over here about a mile, two miles from here. Right, Peter? If you don't know the development of Slings, it's right off the road, right off of uh, where we are here about where uh, Veranda comes over. Is it Veranda? There are 2,500 acres that are going to be developed uh, in Slings. And the question, and Peter's born in high school out there on behalf of, of the city of Salinas. Uh, and there will be elementary districts out there. And you begin to wonder, who's going to buy the houses? Well, where's the money going to come from to buy the houses? And I was asking that question, and someone said to me, Bill, the folks from San Jose, there are no more, there's no more land to develop. So we may well have an encroachment of the Bay Area down into Salinas to buy these houses that are going to be developed. And that will create some type of an income stream in terms of taxes to the city of Salinas. In the meantime, looking back over my experience, I, I think the city of Salinas has done as good a job as could be done to develop the schools to accommodate the potential growth of the area. I wouldn't know how in the world you do it any better than than has been done. Uh, there's a change going on in business, and it's called online buying. And those of us in agriculture see a lot of things. Augie, when you talked about your mom and pop store losing out to Safeway, and now Safeway and other large chain stores are looking at online buying, and we in the produce business are looking at it also. So what I see is just an evolution. Within the agricultural industry, most of the changes have been evolutionary. There have been some revolutionary ones. And the biggest one I can remember was when field packing came into being in the leather's field. And we all went from the leather sheds in town to the field, and now we're still in the field. But we've come back to what used to be called leather sheds and now called plants, and we own one of them. So the evolution is there. The population is growing. And, and in agriculture, we have figured out a way over time, always is this way, to build a bigger bounce, a better bounce trap. And, and what I'm saying, even in my tenure, 62 years, I watched this double the potential uh, uh, energy. What I'm trying to say is the yield the income from an acre of land today has been doubled since when I started in this business 62 years ago. So where there's a world, there's a way, and when there's an economic driving force, 
that all those things will happen. So I see slowly developing just about the way history would record that it has developed over the course of time in, in our country. We have a question over here, and then Sam next. Hi, my name is Bernice House. I moved to the area seven years ago, and I have a question regarding what's the proper way to call East Alisar or um, uh, I keep when I move it was like a controversy. Some people got upset with me. Don't call it Alisal, call it, uh, don't call it Alisal, call it Isalinas. It's not Alisal. So I hear different <laughs> feedbacks about how to call it because at work I need to uh, do some reports and kind of find out what's the proper description. I Google, I talk to people, and everyone has different answers. And, I'm so happy to be here and I want to ask that question. What would it be? <laughs> record it. So people are upset with me because see what your recommendation is. <laughs> Thank you. Alisal or Isalinas? I cannot answer that question. Can anyone answer the question? Is it Isalinas? Is it Alisal? What is it? You know, I think it, it, it it's the eye of the beholder. I'll be real honest with you. I I, I use them interchangeably. Some people get upset with me when I say, no, I don't like tell them to get over it. There are worse well, things to do. But, but, but there's no question there. I mean, I do agree with that. But the real question is, what, what is it about it, about it that offends them? Because I don't understand it myself. And I don't know that I've ever had a, a conversation with somebody that corrected me, maybe just because... <laughs> they that, just don't want to do it. But, but, that's a good question to follow <laughs> but it is. A really Why good are question. you offended? Yeah. Yeah. Why does it matter? Does it have to do with identity? Is there some feeling of a, of a overlooking an identity when you say one or the other? Okay. Thank you. I also was back in the 1930s. I'm not going to walk over there. Yeah. My voice is loud enough. When I came in over here in 56, I lived. On North, South Pepper, South Pepper. Tell me your name. Um, Marianne Wharton. Nice to meet you. Let me give you a We word. had a post office on Wood Street. That post office name was Alisal, not East Alisal. It was Alisal. Even though that part was, belonged to the city of Salinas, and so was the um, Sherwood School was in Salinas School District. It was not in Al South School District, and neither is La, um, Las Padres. That, I was told, was East um, Salinas area. Even though my water bill came to Al South, Alco Water, but our mail was Al South. This is Al this was Alice South California, not oh, Salinas. Okay. Did not become Salinas right. until 63 when we joined. <coughs> but it was never called East Salinas. And anything you received was called Alice South. Right, Jim and Bill? And that, those three don't know that nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> but you're making a point about the annexation, too that it was, right. it was uh, very strongly resisted. And it's right. about controlling your local community. And it was a contested issue for a number of years. And it was not annexed until we 1963. We weren't really wanted, no matter when you came into this area. But people at Alisal did not want to be in Salinas. That wasn't quite, some of them did not some didn't. Uh, <laughs> these three don't want Let me get back right. to the question that, that's actually kind of like that. Is, was there a stigma growing up in the Alice when you went to Stormy's High School? These kids go, oh, you're from the Alice but they look down on you, because Carol's making a great point about class, and, and from that, I agree with her. I came, uh, I came from the, um, well, changed the Alice School, and went into Salinas High, and they all called me the little girl across the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. And then when I was going to get married, uh, one of the fellows uh, told me, uh, uh, my husband's uncle, if he was going to marry me, he said, oh, she's from Okita. I said, what's he talking about? I'm not from Okita. And, and uh, there, there was just that little, but, you know, I always figured I was just as good as anybody else, whether I came from across the tracks or not, I was still me. 
That's a great app. That's why you're 95. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. You're right. He could to people who were. Did you feel marginal? Did you feel like people looked down at each other? Did they look down or far? Yeah. Well, I think they looked down. Yeah. 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 Yeah, when I came into town, it was uh, an eye opener. Uh, coming into town was going from miles south yes, to two miles to walk to town, two miles to three miles to the outside school, and two miles, two miles to everywhere. Uh, yeah, we were in the town of miles. Yeah. And, and we may have had probably an inferiority complex. We had come from Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. And our families had lost everything because of the depression. Uh, so, so probably uh, we were looked down upon and we had to make our own way, but has not always been that way? Don't you always have to make your own way and, and prove your own point? Bill, did they stop looking down on you the first time you hit him on the football field? <laughs> Probably oh, made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are, one thing about the, I'm going to refer to as Okies. Carol asked him one day, did you really think you were Okies? I said, yeah. Even when Virginia was talking to us a couple of weeks ago, she was talking about all of her Okies students. So yeah, Augie, uh, what were your thoughts going up out here and then coming to town? I always felt isolated. We, we uh, in fact, in, a, in our 50th wedding, uh, wedding in a, our 50th high school reunion, Jim, I don't know if you remember this, but three uh, people had drank too much at the, uh, and got up on stage and said, you people from Salinas always crapped on us, and we're not going to let you do that anymore. This was too much of a you know, I, I think we were we were sort of considered outsiders, you know, and uh, I know that I was, my gosh, I can't believe the first time I went in a couple of houses downtown, and I looked today at their very modest houses, I thought they were mansions. I'd never been in a house like that before, and I'd never been in a house, and your, your partner and dear friend of us, Don Ducci, I remember going in Ducci's house. And, God, I was like a mansion, I'd never been in a house like that, and I remember going in Ingrid Eklund and Eklund's across from Lincoln School. But look at it, it's a very modest, probably three bedroom, two bass house, single family. I went in there and I just looked like this. I thought, my gosh, look at this. This place looks like a mansion, you know. And I think that it, you, you're saying that uh, I always felt a, a bit of an outsider because I didn't have much education. And I finally, I finally did go back to Hartnell later, pursuing another, another part of my life. But, uh, and I was always sort of in awe of those people who made it through, and, and Augie went on to wonderful things with education, but, but I didn't do it in the normal fashion. So I always kind of felt like I need to stay in my place, and it wasn't quite there with all of those folks, and I had a great deal of envy for that, you know. So anyway, just, it was just uh, part, of, part of life at that time. Susan, did you have a question? Not a question, <laughs> um, not a question, but kind of a perspective. Um, my name is Susan Aremus, and I'm a direct product of the LSL. I was born in Salinas. I was born in the Salinas Valley Hospital, the same as Jim. And we have a term in Filipino, and it's kababayan, which means town meet. And I have this in common with all of you on the panel. Um, I was, uh, I went to the local schools, um, went to uh, Fremont School for kindergarten, and I eventually was able to teach in Fremont. Uh, went to Barton School, went to El Cisal, and um, went over to Salinas High graduated in class of 66, I'm a cowboy, but that was the time when I graduated, uh, the all the seniors were left in Salinas High, 
those who uh, came from the Al South, and they let the juniors and the sophomores come here to Al South School. And we, we almost all of us, the seniors from the Al South, wanted to come and graduate from Al South High, but they said no. So um, the graduating class, the first graduating class of Al South, is having their 50th class reunion today, I believe. And so um, I still, that term kababayan still means that we are family. So I feel that we are family, whether we come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races. But I have a comment, a, a perspective on housing, where, where we uh, settled. My parents were immigrants from the Philippines. My father was a... Um, World War II veteran, and he worked in the fields as an irrigator out on Davis Road, on Blanco. He, he did all those um, um, jobs in, in, involved in agriculture. And there were just a few families, there are quite a number of families, Filipino families, that were, um, were raising their children in the Salinas area but they, they wanted to move out of the camps, and then they found, um, they gathered their money and tried and, and found that Alisal was where they could afford um, housing. And so there were just a handful of families who came out to the Alisal, um, were still working in the fields, but they had enough money and I, from the stories that my parents told, was that when they applied, when they um, wanted to buy their house, there were petitions circulated in the neighborhood. I live, we now, uh, we lived in, um, on East Alisal Street for 41 years, but at the initial, um, initial influx of those Filipino families, there were petitions against having Filipino families live in the neighborhood. And I don't know how it changed, uh, although that we, we were all able to buy our houses and raise the families there. And, and may, it might have been a negative experience for our family when we first started living in the Alisal, but it turned into a positive one because we made it our home, and we, um, we served our community. I went on to become a teacher and um, taught for 33 years, and, um, and I still enjoy, I still enjoy that experience, and I, I really appreciated the diversity. It was, when I was growing up, there, were, there was more of a mix of different groups, um, and I, I um, took that in as a, a positive experience, and I, I tried to share that with um, my students and their their parents, and to show that you know we were kind of all from coming from the fields, working working in in those dire situation housing situations. But I always try to instill in, in my students that, you know, we can make it. We can, we can do that. So I just wanted to share that, that different story um, among all those um, here who have a, a story to be told. That's a critical story. And I think uh, it's a good one to end on because I think what we've heard from everyone in the audience, all of you and on the panel, is that there was, a, there was a lot of complexity here. These are not simple, it's not a simple progression. Uh, Alice Al did not come out of a vacuum. It was the result of some national um, catastrophes and positives too. There was a new immigration, there were new uh, developments in the agricultural industry that allowed people to move from migrant worker to settled uh, worker to afford to buy a house. It was the first step towards home ownership and business ownership. There were problems associated with that, of course. 
the complexity doesn't make it boring. The complexity makes it more interesting. And the diversity of stories, the differences in stories, make it more interesting. And the fact that uh, policymakers like Anna have tried so hard to uh, deal with these incredible challenges. So when we look at something like the location of a school, uh, we can't just say the bad guys um, uh, added pesticides. We need to say, why was that school located in this in a certain place? So we're going to ask all those questions and hopefully synthesize these multiple voices to make a new version of Selena's history that makes it uh, even more interesting because of its complexity. So I thank you for coming. And we have little gifts for our panelists, um, especially for Patricia, who is turning 95 tomorrow. So I'm going to ask <laughs> you so much for being here.